Congestive heart failure. When you hear those three words, it's like, I'm gonna die. Like, what does that mean? I was born with an irregular heartbeat. So I've always had heart issues. Um, I remember when I was in kindergarten, I had to wear this big heart monitor to school and it was kind of embarrassing, all these wires everywhere. In high school, I really started gaining weight. I think at my heaviest, I got up to 262. And I learned about ketosis and the ketogenic diet. And I would do it for a while, I'd lose some weight, and then I would gain it all back and then more. Rena, I hate this word so much. People tell it to me now too, is just eat in moderation. I can't eat in moderation. A uh, transient ischemic attack, a TIA, which is a mini stroke. They did all sorts of deep tests. Um, they tested my ejection fraction and it turns out mine was low. It was low enough that I was diagnosed with um, congestive heart failure. If I listed all my health ailments and issues, I'm like, there's not even room on the paper to add congestive heart failure to this list of all of these other things. My wife, Jen, and I were watching YouTube and this video popped on from this crazy guy, Dante Ferrigno, and uh, he said, with the, uh, the most extreme version of the carnivore diet. See if we can't do this for at least six weeks. I'm just gonna do an elimination diet for 30 days. I stopped snoring on the first day. When you're on carnivore, just eating meat, red meat for 200 days, what happened to your heart failure? Well, a couple of weeks ago, um... Kerry, welcome. Thank you, Rena, happy to be here. Now you sent me this email because I asked you to send it to me because I wanted to know your story beyond what we see on your YouTube channel. What I read in the email was absolutely incredible. And the true transformation that you have had, you were on close to 20 medications for heart failure, acid reflux, depression, gout, and so many other things. And in that email, you said that 200 days ago, about 200 days, you decided to just eat meat, salt, and water and see what might happen. And what happened was truly unexpected, especially what happened to your heart. So today, Kerry and I are going to talk about all of these changes that happened in the last 200 days of just eating meat, including what happened to Kerry's heart and his heart failure. Because I know many people, they're worried about heart attacks and heart disease. But before we get into all of that. Kerry, what was life like before you started Carnival? Oh, it was, uh, it wasn't all this way, but for much of it, it was very, uh, very desperate and very hopeless for, for many, many years. Um, I guess depending on how far back I go, but when I was, I was born with an irregular heartbeat. So I've always had heart issues. Um, I remember when I was in kindergarten, I had to wear this big heart monitor to school and it's kind of embarrassing all these wires everywhere and throughout the years i had to wear those over and over again because i've always had this uh irregular heartbeat and um when i was 14 uh, my wife jen and i met in middle school and we've actually been together ever since so those are some happier years um, but then in high school i started getting chubby started putting the weight on um, started having really bad stomach issues like IBS and bloating and I actually had this period where I was having um, blood in my stool and I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and I was later subsequently told no you didn't have Crohn's disease it was something else I'm not sure what that was just a kind of a bad period for a while um, but yeah in high school I really started gaining weight I think at my heaviest I got up to 262 and my stomach issues after high school, my stomach issues just got worse and worse. So I was diagnosed with IBS, I had acid reflux, just constant uh, stomach issues and stomach pains. It was always bloating and hurting. Uh, at one point, my appendix burst and um, it was like incredibly painful. My appendix was hurting and I went into the hospital and it burst right as I got to the hospital. And I almost died, um, but thankfully it burst at the hospital and it was like a big procedure cleaning all that out. A uh, couple of years after that, it just continued with the stomach issues and my doctor did some testing. He's like, your gallbladder is just a little off. It's probably fine, but since you have all these stomach issues, maybe we should remove it. So I had my gallbladder uh, removed 
and still like nothing nothing was working i just um i had several colonoscopies i had like polyps they did an endoscopy and i had all sorts of inflammation in my throat and the guy was like this is kind of like precancerous so we want you to do this endoscopy and colonoscopy at a more regular frequency based on what he was seeing uh, but nothing ever fixed it all the doctors i talked to too i'm like with the ibs they tried putting me on different diets like the fodmap diet um nothing nothing worked i was just always having stomach issues and stomach pains and so i just kind of kept going along with it uh i yo-yo dieted I, I tried different things and i'd have some success but I'd, I'd end up gaining all the weight back i i learned early on that i just i can't moderate at all um but yeah and when i was like 25 or so life was okay other than the stomach issues my wife and i had our first daughter uh lily and then at 27 we found out we're having triplets and we actually found that out at the ultrasound, at the five-month ultrasound. So that was a really remarkable time in my life that I will, of course, never forget. We It was completely natural. It was completely unexpected. They don't run, triplets don't run in our family. And for some reason, Jen, um, she had her ultrasound at five months, which was pretty late. And it's really funny, Rena, because you know when you're when you're expecting, everyone always asks you like, what do you want, a boy or a girl? Everyone that asks me that, I'm like, I don't know, but I have a feeling we're having twins. It just seems like there's more than one. And then people will say, well, why did you think that? And I was like, because Jen is just like twice as grumpy as she was with the first pregnancy. It just seems like that. And it turns out she was actually behaving because she should have been three times as grumpy. But yeah, the ultrasound tech said, uh-oh. I was like, what does that mean? She's like, there's more than one. Oh, there's there's four. Oh no, no, it's just three. And I was like, I almost passed out and I was like, this is crazy. And then I was just worried if they were healthy or not. Thankfully they were all healthy, but that ultrasound tech, I'm like, don't they train you not to say, uh Oh, that should be like day one of ultrasound school or something like, um, but yeah. So then we had the, we had the triplets, uh, at 32 weeks. And, um, so that was a really happy time in my life. I was still having the stomach issues. I was way overweight. Uh, and then after we had the triplets, it was all a blur. Like it was just diaper changes, feeding, like no sleep for the first couple of years. It was like a baby factory, just processing these kids through trying to get them fed and diapers changed and things like that. So I think it was like around in my thirties, uh, my, my weight got worse. And then I started getting depression, uh, really, really bad. I've always been kind of anxious and my anxiety since my thirties has gotten just far worse but the depression I had uh, just it got so deep and so dark and so hopeless and so desperate it's hard to explain to people that haven't been through depressions I've had people say to me oh you know just go out and go for a walk you'll feel better but it's the kind of depression you can't get up out of bed and um, mine just got worse and worse uh, to the point where I became I be I started getting insomnia I, I would sleep like maybe an hour at night um, it's, it's so hard to describe, but I was, I was almost catatonic. I would just sit there just completely hopeless. And, um, it was, it, it's a, it's horrible to kind of think about it with a clear mind now, like what it was doing to my wife and the four girls, um, them having to see me like that. Uh, it's kind of one of my, my biggest regrets. And e even at the time, it just got worse and worse. I mean, this thing started and I ended up going through depression for 10 years, 12 years. Uh, the depression started and got worse and worse to the point where I used to, we used to have this uh, detached workshop at our house and I would just go down, it had no windows. I would just go down there and I would sit in there for hours and hours and hours. I probably spent weeks down there over the course of a couple of years. I would just sit in the dark, just doing nothing just I couldn't I couldn't face the world uh let alone uh face my girls and my wife it was just uh it was definitely hitting me then and it's definitely hitting me now just how horrible it had to be for them seeing their father or her husband uh like that but there was nothing I could do about it it's just it's such a dark dark place it's so hard to describe to people I don't I don't really really know how to do it I remember uh, one thing that happened was, um, I, I don't want to mention his name either because there's speculation, but there's a big celebrity that had committed suicide around that time. And when I heard that news, um, we're, my wife and girls and I were 
we love the movies. This one kind of bright, bright light. Uh, more recently, anyways, a year ago, we purchased our small town movie theater. And so we've always loved movies and this particular uh, actor I loved. And so when I heard he committed suicide, I was, I was simultaneously heartbroken. And then this speaks to the depression. I was somewhat happy for him and somewhat jealous at the same time, thinking like, good man, at least you are, you're kind of free now. Like you're, you're free from this horrible, horrible pain that I understand and a lot of people don't understand. I think what you've shared is something that not many people talk about. The depression is not just what you're talking. I've been through something similar where I couldn't go. I mean, it doesn't sound as bad as yours, but I could not go outside because I couldn't face the world. I had social anxiety. I just couldn't, I couldn't function in life. Everything was so overwhelming. I just want to, I didn't want to live. This was before carnival, before trying to optimize my own health. But I think that for people watching, this might seem a lot to hear, but this is very, very common. And I think people don't talk about this a lot. So I commend you, Kerry, for sharing, for opening, for being vulnerable, because this helps to understand Kerry's carnival story, because there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So please continue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and then people were saying when this person committed suicide too, they're like, how could he have done that to his children? And instantly in my head, it's so sick now in retrospect, I'm like, I know how he did it. Like if I did that to myself, I would be relieving my children from this burden of just seeing their father just so hopeless and depressed all the time. And yeah, it's going to be hard for them. It's going to be horrible, but what, you know, it's going to make them stronger in the long run. That was like how messed up my brain was to try to justify it. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a very dark place. And unfortunately that was just the beginning of it and it got worse and worse. So, um, eventually my wife helped me and we went, I got, I sought help and I went to a psychiatrist and they put me on SSRIs and they, they told me, we've got this medication for you. There's nothing else you can really do. You can try this. The horrible part of all of that was I was just so hopeless and suicidal and they're like, you can try the, these, this medicine, but it's going to take three months before it works. It's not going to work the first week or the first month. It's going to take three months before we know if it works. I'm like, I don't know if I have three months. Like, I don't know if I can go three months to see if this thing works. I did it for the three months and it did like nothing for me. And then I went back in again and the depression's getting worse. They're like, oh, okay, we'll just up the dosage. And then I did that for three months. And then they upped it again for, I did that for a year on one medication and then another medication and another medication. And I ended up doing that cycle for probably 10 years or so. And um, just uh, at one point, like, you know, I wasn't, <clears throat> I wasn't suicidal anymore, which was great, but I had no emotion. It was just like I was a zombie. It was just like, it was like, what's the point of living? There's like no ups or downs or anything. It was just no way to, to live. And um, I, yeah, I stayed like that for a, a very long time. So the, the hopelessness, I've heard other people talk about hopelessness recently um, that kind of defined me for many, many years. Uh, and then it got even kind of worse. So that, that went on for many years. And then in, um, in 2015, well, I, I guess I'll jump back for a second. During this time, like maybe eight years into the depression, I learned about ketosis and the ketogenic diet. And I, I, I tried it. I'm like, I'm desperate, like anything, I'm going to try this. And I tried it and it helped me a little bit. Like I, I started sleeping a little bit better and it, it, it was the only thing that ever touched my anxiety and depression. The only thing like those pills made me into a zombie, but this was like, maybe there's some hope here, but it only took it a little bit for me. And I would do it for a while. I'd lose some weight and then I would gain it all back and then more. I would lose some weight and then I would say what everyone tells me. And I, I, Rena, I hate this word so much. People tell it to me now too is, just eat in moderation. I can't eat in moderation. I cannot eat in moderation either. No way. <laughs> yeah. I, some people can, I, I think some people can do it. I, I applaud them because I can't. And my thing now is I look at sugar like it's an addictive drug. For me, it's worse than cocaine or any other drug in the world. I can't have a little bit of sugar. So you would never tell a drug addict, just do your drugs in moderation now. Well, that's what I did on keto is I'd start feeling a little bit better. I'd start losing some weight and then I'd be like, I'm, I'm getting better now. I can go back to moderation. I'm going to do it right this time. And then I'd have some like strawberries or raspberries or just really low glycemic good stuff. And my, my body be like, more, 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 more. And I gain it all back. And I did that yo-yo 
for 10 years, 15 years, my weight would go up and down and up and down. But I just want to say a big thank you because we have grown so much in the last few months and it's all because of you. So can I just ask for a quick favor? If you love the videos that I put on this channel, if you love the guests and their stories on this channel, can I please ask you to hit that subscribe button so that we can share their stories to the world and help people transform their lives. Thank you so much. Uh, in 2015, I was depressed again and my insomnia was just horrible. And I was on one of the downs where I wasn't on the keto and my weight was up. And I, I think I was close to 250 at that, 250 pounds in weight at that time. My insomnia was just really, really bad. Uh, I was sitting at home and all of a sudden uh, I was just confused. I had this utter confusion and the right side of my face got numb and my fingers were numb and I was, uh, I tried to get up, I kind of fell over and I was trying to explain to my wife what was going on. I could barely explain what was going on. And so she called an ambulance and they picked me up and um, then this whole, <laughs> This whole binder of stuff started happening. This is my stroke binder they gave me. So I ended up having, this was my diagnosis. I actually just found this paper when you were asking me, Rena. Uh, transient ischemic attack, a TIA, which is a mini stroke. I had that about eight years ago in 2015. And um, yeah, after the mini stroke. So for those that don't know, a mini stroke, it's not permanent like a stroke. So you oftentimes people will have these and then they'll go in and they will, they'll do all the scans and you're, you're not going to see the permanent damage like you would with a stroke. Thankfully, that's what happened with me. But I had to go to a hospital in the big city. I spent a couple days in the stroke uh, unit and they were doing all these tests on me. And then they started me on all sorts of medications. Well, as a result of after the mini stroke, you're like, well, why did this happen? Uh, and it, it's kind of interesting too reading this. So the principal diagnosis was TIA, mini stroke, and then the additional diagnosis was depression that they wrote on here, which I thought was interesting. How is depression associated with TIA? Well, I think what it is, is the factors that contribute to depression can exasperate and lead to a stroke. One of the big ones being sleep. And I was having insomnia then and no sleep. And so after this, they're like, we got to do more tests on you. And then, then they started doing more heart tests. And as I mentioned earlier, I've always had this irregular heartbeat, but that was the extent of it. They never said there's anything wrong with your heart. Lots of people have this irregular heartbeat. They said, we want to keep a closer look on it. Uh, but after the, when I had the mini stroke, they did all sorts of deep tests. Um, they tested my ejection fraction, which is kind of a measure of how strong your heart is. And is it keeping up with the needs of your body? And it turns out mine was low it was low enough that i was diagnosed with um, congestive heart failure um, and then the sleep too uh, i was talking about the sleep with them well then they had me go and do a sleep study in fact i think i've done two or three sleep studies where you you go off to this facility it's so crazy that you're supposed to like sleep normally and you're in this other facility but they put you out they hook you up to all this um, equipment and they measure your sleep and I would stop breathing. I would be gasping for air throughout the night because I was snoring and I had sleep apneas hundreds of times. I think it was like 400 times throughout the night I would stop breathing and gasping for air. So a lot of those things I think lead to depression, but also if you have sleep apnea, it greatly increases your odds of having a stroke or heart disease or things like that. So I have to ask because you just kind of like went over the fact that you were diagnosed with congestive heart failure. So that doesn't mean that your heart is going to stop. It just means that your heart cannot meet the blood requirements um, or pump out enough blood out of your heart. What were your feelings when you got diagnosed with congestive heart failure? Like, I mean, I would die, I think, that if I got diagnosed with that. Yeah, and it, I exactly. I was um, congestive heart failure. When you hear those three words, it's like, I'm going to die. Like, what does that mean? I didn't know what it meant. And it is a serious thing. But like you said, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to die. It, it means that your heart can't keep up and they got to keep a close eye on it. And you got to take medication and it could get worse. You could end up with AFib and that can lead to a stroke even more. So I had to do lots of additional tests for that. So yeah, initially before they educated me on it, uh, I was scared. And then I was just like, Jeez, another, like what, I can't, like if I listed all my health ailments and issues, I'm like, there's not even room on the paper to add congestive heart failure to this list of all of these other things. This is the email yeah. that yeah, Carrie sent. Do you know how many times I had to read this? Oh, okay. Now this is another thing. 
Kerry was on, I, I counted everything that he told me and it was about 16 medications. Then Kerry seems to say, I was on more medications. How many medications are in that bucket? I think there's 20 in here. A lot of these are the SSRIs that I, I went through. There's ones for um, anxiety, sleep, acid reflux, um, IBS, upset stomach, um, Omazepal, I think that was for the acid reflux. Yeah, there's there's probably 20 in here and there's probably, as I'm starting to look through this, as you were asking me these questions, I'm like, oh, I don't even remember. I was on that one and I was on that one and I was on that one. So it was a host of drugs. So I've got them all here. I didn't even know that somebody could be on that many medications. There was one other thing that you mentioned in your email, which was quite important, which was you had a toe arthritis, which doctors said that you had to have surgery. Now, you don't have to have surgery. How did that happen? Yeah, that was, uh, after all these other things I listed, that was one of the last things um, before I before I finally changed my life forever. Uh, it was about two years ago now. It was 18 months ago. It was for 18 months. All of a sudden, one day, I was like, oh my goodness, my foot hurts really bad. What is this? And the first day it happened, it hurt so bad. I My daughter had um, crutches from when she had an injury. I had to use her crutches. I couldn't put any pressure down on it. Um, I, I waited till the next day and then it started easing up a little bit. But then for 18 months after that, every single day, just horrible, excruciating pain in the toe of my right foot, in the second toe. And it felt like a broken bone. Like I'd stepped down on it and it hurt so bad. I went into a doctor. And um, they went over my family history. My dad has gout. They're like, oh, this is probably gout. And then they checked my uric acid level. And it was just slightly elevated. And I was, in my head, I told the doctor, I said, I know my dad has gout. I don't think this is gout because I, I know it's bad to do your own research. But I was doing my own research. And a lot of the other symptoms of gout I didn't have. And it didn't feel like it. It felt different. Like people get it swollen and you could see it. I had none of that. This guy insisted. He's like, Carrie, this is gout. Don't be Dr. Google and try to figure this out yourself. And so they put me on more medication. And and it was the same story as the SSRIs. Like, this is going to take a while before we know if it works or not. And I went on it for like a couple months and it did nothing. He said, oh, no problem. We just got to up the dosage and then up the dosage again. And I, for 18 months, I did three different medications. I did, I think, four injections in my toe. I was taking steroids. I was taking all of this stuff. I saw two different doctors that both thought it was gout. And then I saw a third guy that was a really good foot specialist. It's all he did was like foot surgeries and foot stuff. And he uh, did an x-ray and he looked closer at it. And he's like, this isn't gout. He's like, you just have, it's just, it's horrible arthritis and inflammation all centered in that one toe. It's never going to get better unless we do this surgery. The surgery requires basically like cutting the toe in half, relieving the pressure. They're, they were going to put like this metal, like ball bearing kind of thing in there and then put the toe back together. And, uh, that was one of the, it was 18 months. Like I, and those 18 months, besides all this other stuff, I still had the depression and anxiety and all that stuff. Um, I did, I did nothing for like 18 months throughout the years. Like I'd do some keto, I'd do some stuff. I'd be a little bit more active, but the last 18 months I did, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. Like my dad would be like, Hey, you want to go golfing with me? I'm like, no, I, nothing. I can't put pressure down on my foot. It hurts. So I ended up just being kind of Kind of like my initial depression where I'm just sitting around the house doing nothing again. And that's why I wanted to interview you, Kerry, because there's so many people out there that they find the their why to start carnivore because doing carnivore is not something that you, you just do just on your own. You have to have a strong why. And everything that you have listed, including the, the congestive heart failure, which is not really curable or reversible by most doctors, but something very interesting happened when you started the carnival lifestyle. So let's now talk about your carnival journey and everything that happened. What, how did you first hear about the carnival diet? I've, from a man that I, I really, I owe my life to, I thank him every time I speak to him. Dante from Ferrigno Freedom a YouTuber, an individual that decided to document his personal story, his example, and put it on YouTube. Jen and I, I, like I said, I had some success with keto over the years. And Jen and I, my wife Jen and I were watching YouTube and this video popped on from this crazy guy, Dante Ferrigno. And uh, he said, I'm, he was just starting. This was two years prior. He's like, I'm just starting this carnivore diet. I didn't even know what carnivore was. Like if you would have asked me what's carnivore, I'd be like, 
what is that like that liver king guy like what is that i don't i i really i didn't even know what it was but, but then i learned from him and he's actually doing the lion diet version which was more extreme but he's like i'm just gonna eat beef salt and water that's all i'm gonna do and I, we watched that video and i'm like man this is interesting like the guy is so passionate and fired up and i i i, I could sense his hopelessness just like i had so he really he resonated with me i like I, I could, I had so much empathy for him. Um, but also I was kind of uh, being cynical and a jerk. I noticed the videos from two years ago. I'm like, there's, this is, this is crazy. Like it sounds great on paper. Okay. You're going to only eat meat and you're not going to have any things. There's no way he's going to sustain this. There's no way you could just eat meat. And then I noticed his video was from two years ago. And I said to my wife, Jen, I'm like, let's fast forward, see his most recent video. There's no way this guy's still eating meat two years later. I, I looked at his video from two years later. You could not recognize Dante completely different human not only did he lose all of his weight i could see in his eyes his face his demeanor completely different person overcoming depression stomach issues like he had that carnivore zen that carnivore glow and he was so fired up and passionate about it so uh that's that was my introduction to carnivore uh, but I was still like, this guy's an outlier and he's insane. And I was doing everything in my head to be like, just how, how are you going to eat meat? There's no way. And then I started doing more research. I learned about Dr. Ken Berry. I learned about Dr. Anthony Chafee. And this one thing about me is um, I can't moderate. I do things to extremes. And when I started hearing about this, I went to the extreme. Like when I tell you, I think I watched every Dr. Berry video. Uh, most of Dr. Chafee videos, I found him a little bit later. Then I still didn't believe, I was like, I saw Dr. Berry's video about um, eating bacon. I'm like, this guy is a scam artist. Like, I thought that as well. I was like, you can eat bacon? Bacon's fine? Bacon is not going to cause a heart attack? Oh my God. I ate so much bacon. Let me just tell you. Let me just tell you. Yes, same. Uh, but not at that point. At that point, I'm like, this guy's selling something. There's something crazy. Then I saw one of Dr. Berry's videos. And of all of these health issues that I told you guys about, one thing I didn't have, but I think I was close to getting was um, type 2 diabetes. Uh, and I, Dr. Berry did a video on reversing type 2 diabetes. And I didn't really know that much about type 2 diabetes. But in my head, I'm like, you can reverse type 2 diabetes? I thought that was something people get. A lot of people in my family have it. I'm like, they've had it for years. You can't reverse that. You just get it. Well, I saw his video still being cynical and skeptical. And then I read the comments. He's, Dr. Berry's done two or three videos on this. If you guys want to have a big smile on your face, read those comments. There's a thousand comments from individuals saying, Dr. Barry, you changed my life forever. Dr. Barry, you saved my life. Dr. Barry, my A1C was this and this. One guy said, Dr. Barry, I've been going to my doctor for 10 years for type 2 diabetes and your 10 minute video completely changed my life when 10 years of going to my normal doctor did nothing for me. So that was when I was convinced. And even then, I, I don't know if I'm extreme or what, but I'm like, I still can't wrap my brain around just eating meat. So what I did, and this really helped me was I'm like, I'm not going to tell myself I'm going to eat meat for 30 days. I, I decided I could do anything for 30 days, right? But I still couldn't wrap my brain around eating meat for 30 days. So I'm like, I'm just going to do an elimination diet for 30 days. Everyone can agree, get rid of sugar, get rid of seed oils, get rid of all these toxins and food dyes. I'm going to get rid of all of that. Well, essentially what I was telling myself was I'm going to eat meat only, but I phrased it a different way. And that helps. That helps get over the burden because if you just say I'm eating meat, it's like, well, can I not have anything else? But if you, if you say, I'm just giving myself a little bit of a challenge, easy. And then. Yep. And I had done keto on and off for years. So I'm like, I, 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 I should be able to do this fine. It's just really extreme keto. And eating stuff. So yeah, I started doing it. And uh, this isn't the case for everyone, but my results were remarkable relatively quickly. The first thing I noticed in the first couple of days was that I had this out of all the ailments and issues I listed. I don't know if I listed this one too. I had lower back pain for years. Like every night I'd be like, Jen, could you please rub my back? And she'd rub it and never really did anything just for years and years. Within a couple of days, that was gone. And then I was like, man, my elbow feels better too. I didn't even know my elbow hurt before this and these things that I didn't even realize. And the craziest thing for me, I tell people this and they're like, there's no way that's even possible, but it's the truth. Um, the, f and it, it's probably different for me because I, I was doing uh, keto on and off before. Um, but I stopped snoring on the first day, my wife, the next morning, she's like, you didn't snore last night. This was like a big thing. Like what is going on? Cause this was a contentious thing. I was snoring all the time. She was we're like ready to sleep in separate bedrooms. And I've since learned a lot of people report that same thing. 
Uh, Jordan Peterson, he has his famous testimonial he did on Joe Rogan. He says right in there, the first week he stopped snoring. And that made me mad because I did these two different sleep studies I mentioned to you before. And the doctor said to me, listen, dude, you're way overweight. At that point, I think I was 80 pounds overweight. He's like, you got to lose like 80 pounds. Your neck, your, your throat, it's huge. Once that fat goes down, you'll stop snoring. But I've since learned, yeah, maybe partially. I stopped snoring before I lost all my weight. I didn't lose a pound and I stopped snoring. It was inflammation. It was just inflammation. And when you go on carnivore, I hear this from so many people, that inflammation goes away quick. Like in the first, for a lot, everyone's different, but for a lot of people, that inflammation goes away quick and it can be life-changing. Like if you stop snoring, that's, Rena, when I talk about that CPAP machine, I hated that thing for years. I had to strap this thing to my head. I didn't want to shave. I've always had the beard and mustache. I'm like, I had to have it on really tight. I'm like, how crazy is this that I have to strap this apparatus to my face and pump air through my airway because I'm so inflamed from the foods I'm eating that my throat is closing up and I'm gasping for air all night. Like how unnatural of a world am I living in now that this is what I have to go through? So... I was ecstatic uh, with with that. So the sleep app, the people always ask me that, like, how did you get off it? How did you do it? That's something you definitely don't want to just drop and um, ease off of. The cool thing with my CPAP machine and a lot of them is they'll tell you how many times you stop breathing throughout the night. So I always tell people, like, if you're starting carnivore, don't stop. Like, talk to your doctor, do whatever. But if you have that machine and you use it, you can see your progress with the data, like, uh, how your sleep is improving over time. But that was remarkable to me right in the first couple of days that happened. And then the other thing that happened sort of early on, maybe the first week or two was uh, the brain fog started clearing. And I knew I had brain fog before carnivore. But as they say, someone said this to me, and I love this saying, you can't see the fog while you're in the fog. You have to get out of it. And it's so true. I knew I had brain fog. I would always have trouble finding my words. I would say to the girls like, oh, we're done eating dinner. Like go empty the, the tourney thing with the water in it. What is that? The, the dishwasher. It would take me 10 minutes to find a word. It was pathetic. So I knew about it, but I didn't know the extent of it until afterwards because it's just like thinking so much more clearly now uh, on carnivore. So yeah, those first two weeks, the those things started improving. Uh, the, the issue with my foot, my foot was still hurting. Uh, but I think it was around day 30, uh, maybe day 25. I'm really bad with dates, but around day 25, I noticed significant improvement in my foot. I think it was maybe around day 50 where my foot that I was going to need to have surgery on, that I almost agreed to have surgery on, 100% better. I don't have any aches or pains. And that was 18 months. Do you see the power? This is just, I mean, it's incredible. Everything, like your whole story was from... 40 years of chronic suffering and depression and all this. And this happened in three weeks, under three weeks, and in the subsequent months from just taking out all of the rubbish and eating meat. And that's why, you know, it's just incredible every time that you say this and I hear your story from just what you eat. I was also curious to know what were doctors saying to you before, before you started carnivore? Did, were they supportive of you doing carnival? Because that's a big thing. People are going to want to do carnival. They're going to see their doctor. The doctor is going to say something else. What did your doctor tell you? Yeah. Well, the first thing, many, many, most of these pills were from different doctors, different specialists. And one thing they didn't tell me, first of all, was anything about nutrition. None of them did. I, I guess when I had IBS, they said, try the FODMAP diet. But depression, anxiety, IBS, uh, the foot issues, nobody ever said anything about nutrition. Uh, one doctor at one point, I did mention that when I was doing keto and um, yeah, it was it was too extreme. It's not good for your heart. Uh, I, I believe he used the M word, uh, just eat in moderation, uh, <laughs> count your calories, that kind of stuff. And meanwhile, I'm not, I'm not judging him, but it's like, he was overweight and not healthy. And I'm like, why am I taking advice from him? That That's my thing in retrospect too, is my whole life, I put all my trust in doctors. And I believe most doctors are good and they mean well. I think there's just, we've lost our way so much. Now I'm like, I'm not going to a doctor unless I need, like I have a bone that's broken or I need some major surgery or something. It's so many issues. I foolishly went to the doctor before thinking that I needed medication for, and it was just nutrition, but... Yeah. So the, the, the 30 days was just crazy on day 30. Um, well, the other thing that happened to the brain fog, 
my anxiety started going down. And my anxiety, I didn't really talk about that too much, but it was horrible. Talking to you now, Rena, I would crash my car into a tree before I would do this. I, I kind of joke about that, but I used to do that. I used to have calls with customers for years, for years. And every single day I would have the call, I would get so anxious and so worked up. I'd be on my lunch break. I'd be like, if I just lightly crash my car into a tree, I could get out of this call. Like I've thought about that over and over and over again. I hated talking to people. I hated phone calls and my anxiety started going down. And I don't, I don't know exactly the date when it happened, but at one point I'm like, this is crazy. I have zero anxiety right now. It's completely polar opposite from before. And then the depression, uh, the, that, that was the biggest eye opening thing for me. It's like, I don't know how to describe this to people, but people are always like, Oh, Carrie, you did that 30 day video. So I, I, I've been doing YouTube for eight years now, mostly homesteading stuff on my day 30. I'm like, this is remarkable. I'm just going to do a video and say, look at all this stuff. This, this is crazy. What's happening. Let me just put this out there. I put the video out just as kind of a fun thing to do, but I started getting all these comments from people like, this is so inspiring. Or the other comment was, I'm 80. I've been doing this for five years. Everything you're saying, Carrie, happened to me. Everything you're saying, Carrie, happened to me. I heard that over and over again. I'm like, this is crazy. So many people have been doing this with so much success. And um, yeah, the the I I felt like I felt like I'm standing like in downtown New York and there's a treasure chest on the ground with billions of dollars in it. I'm like, everyone, look at this. Look what I found. And everyone's just blindly walking by, like oblivious. Like, no, we're good. It was, it was a weird thing, but, um, yeah, the fact that I, that the depression, this is the crazy part. So I'm talking like on day 30, I started noticing the anxiety going away and then the depression going away. And I think by day 30, my depression was significantly like, I didn't even notice it anymore. It was crazy. I think like around day 20 that started happening. Um, and then I did a call with, uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee, I think around day 30. 30 or 40. And he was like, Carrie, wait, it's going to get better. I'm like, how could it get any better than this? I feel amazing compared to what I did before. And he was absolutely right. Like I'm on month six now, every day it gets better and better where it's, it's not just that I am no longer depressed and I'm no longer anxious. That would have been a huge blessing. I would have given everything in the world to be no longer depressed and no longer anxious. It's the polar opposite. My default demeanor now, I have a smile on my face. Before I was grinding my teeth and I was holding all my anxiety in my mouth. I'm happy all the time. Like I want for nothing anymore. And it's like, I'm, I, I feel like I'm living my life to the fullest potential. Like there, I want for nothing more. There's nothing else I could ask for. I feel just so amazing. It's, it's just crazy. And yeah, I did that 30 day video and then I just started getting all of these comments. I was so hopeless before. And one of the first people I talked to that was a carnivore, I think he might've been the first carnivore I talked to was uh, Sean White from Intentional Carnivore. Um, I carry this picture around with me, but just if anyone doesn't quick reference, he lost 243 pounds in one year. And when I spoke to Sean, he was the first carnivore I talked to. And uh, I did a YouTube video with him. And his story was he lost way more weight than I did. And he's been through so much, but he was hopeless. And he kept using that word hopeless. And I just, his story resonated with me so much. He was depressed on his couch for years and he kept saying hopeless. And I'm like, there's so many people out there that are hopeless right now that are desperate. And we have the answer right here. This is it. And those people are going to go to the doctor and they're going to get a bunch of these and they're going to just keep continue being hopeless and then be worse and worse. That's the thing that when you realize the power is in what you eat and how to fix your lifestyle. I mean, doctors and surgeries and hospitals and all that, there is a there's a reason for that. And there, like if you have a broken bone or a joint or something that you have to go to hospitals and a doctor. But when it comes to mental health issues, when it comes to your physical health, we can fix so many things with what we eat. I was curious to know, this is one thing that everybody wants to know. When you're on carnivore, just eating meat, red meat for 200 days, what happened to your heart failure? your irregular heartbeat, and your heart function. Yes. So this carnivore thing is full of surprises and it continues. I'm like, I can't get any better than this. Well, a couple of weeks ago, um, well, first of all, I started exercising for the first time. This was maybe two months into carnivore. I didn't exercise to lose a pound either, by the way. 
Um, but I just started getting this more energy and I, I couldn't exercise before I was, that was one of the things I used to hate too. When people say to someone that's overweight, just exercise. I was so sick and fatigued. I look at it like I had pneumonia or I was, I had the flu. Like, how am I going to exercise when I feel this sick? I started exercising, having more energy. And that was always weird with my heart issues and the congestive heart failure. So I started noticing that a little bit. But a couple of weeks ago, my wife, Jen, and I were watching a movie in bed. And she had her head on my chest and she kind of just got up and looked at me weird. And she's like, we've been together since we're 14. She knows all my heart issues and everything. She's been in much of my appointments. She's like, your heart is beating normally. What is going on? I'm like, what? This is crazy. Literally since I was born, like I said, in kindergarten, I had these heart monitors on every couple of years. I'm wearing these monitors. Just like a year ago, I wore a heart monitor for a week. I had the irregular heartbeat. I even had some AFibs in there. So it's completely normal. And I actually ran to the pharmacy and I bought a stethoscope. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta check this closer. I was like beating normal for the first time. Like what is going on? And then I started noticing more things. I started like all these things are happening so quickly. It's, you got to have a journal. You got to write this stuff down because there's stuff I'm even considering now. I'm like, I didn't even know this happened, but one of the the biggest, everyone will say, well, this is anecdotal or whatever, but throughout the last eight years of having this congestive heart failure diagnosis, there's been one constant. Uh, my wife and girls and I, we always, we missed a couple, but we'd always go to church on Sunday. And when you go to church on Sunday, it's so much sit down, stand up and sing, sit down, stand up and sing. And when I used to do that uh, before carnivore, every, I'm not joking, I'm not exaggerating, almost every time I'd stand up, I would see stars and I would get dizzy and I would have to grab the pew in front of me. It was like a new process for me. I knew how to do it. Like I adapted myself with the congestive heart failure because I knew I'd stand up, I'd get dizzy. And Jen was always standing next to me in case I'd fall over and I'd grab that pew. Well, I started noticing on carnivore, I don't know if it was maybe 40 or 50 days into it at church. I'm like, oh, I'm not dizzy anymore. And it completely reversed now where it's, it's completely gone. Like I, I don't get dizzy standing up at all anymore. Even from this chair, when I'd stand up before I would get dizzy. It's completely gone. Not even that it's gone. It's just like the depression it's reversed where I legitimately think I could get out and just like run a marathon or I could sprint or I, I could, I couldn't even imagine doing that before. And it's just completely reversed. And I've been so fortunate in the meantime to learn more about this, but it's not uncommon. I've heard of a lot of people that their irregular heartbeat changes on carnivore. And then, um, I was so fortunate I was able to talk to, I've been able to talk to so many people. Dr. Philip Ovadia, heart surgeon. This guy's a heart surgeon that does carnivore, by the way. Um, and the heart performs so much more efficiently while you're in ketosis. Another fact that I'm really upset that none of these cardiologists over the years ever mentioned that. Not that it's going to fix it, but I was doing keto on and off. And if one of them said to me, you know, maybe you're going to do better if you stick in ketosis. No one ever said that to me, but there's all sorts of science on that that, your brain and your heart are much more efficient when you're in ketosis and I'm, it's remarkable. I'm seeing it. So, uh, and a couple, I tried to get the soonest appointment I could, but I'm going into the cardiologist to get the whole thing of tests and I can't wait to see what they're going to say. I'm not going to tell them either. I'm not going to tell them till the end. They're going to be like, what did you do differently? You lost all this weight. So Kerry's going to go see his cardiologist, get the full test, his blood work and everything done in December. So we're going to be very keen to see every everything and all the results. But what you, what you can see from even just doing carnival that he has cured or reversed his irregular heartbeat. So an arrhythmia that he was born with, that he's had for about 43 years from just eating meat for 200 days. He's no longer dizzy. He has reversed all all of these chronic ailments that he suffered with for over 40 years. So it's not to say that this is going to happen to you. It's not to say that you should follow exactly what Kerry is doing. But the fact that carnivore can help your life so much. So if you're just thinking about doing carnivore, Kerry, what would you tell people if they're just thinking? Because this, this was my last question, but it's a good um, question to ask now. What would you say to people that are just curious about like, Hmm, carnival. I'm just curious about it. Should should they start it? Yes. Like you deserve to live at least one day feeling like I feel like a proper natural human with no inflammation. It's so sad. Like kids these days, they're they're never gonna know what it's like to feel normal. They're started on sugar from a young age and their body's inflamed and they have all these aches and ailments and issues, and then they get ADHD and learning disorders and all these things you deserve for yourself just to try it for one day. And I don't know anyone like 
of course, you're going to be scared. I'm going to only eat meat. How's it sustainable? I encourage people just do what I did. Say, I'm going to eliminate all of these other things, these horrible seed oils and sugar and inflammatory foods and food dyes. I'm going to do that for 30 days and just see how I feel. Give your body a reset. And um, just, just the other thing I encourage people is, if you're scared to do carnivore, what you should really be scared about is what if you don't do carnivore? Where do you see yourself in a year from now or five years from now continuing to do what you did that got you to this point where you're miserable or you got depression and anxiety or you have all these aches and pains and ailments? And trust me, you have things wrong with you that you're not even realizing now because you've suffered from them for so long they become normal to you. You deserve to live a day without that. And I... I'm going to keep getting the word out there. And for those people out there that are hopeless, that's the reason I'm so passionate and fired up about this is because there's so many hopeless people out there that are desperate and you don't have to be hopeless. It seems so hard and incredible too. Oh, I'm just going to eat meat. It's hard getting your brain and getting into it. But for the last 200 or so days, it's a breeze. I absolutely love it. You get over those sugar cravings and you have them no more. There, there couldn't, I've done every diet in the world. There couldn't be an easier way. It's not even a diet. It's a way of life. I don't even think about eating. And uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's amazing. Like you deserve to, you deserve to feel like a proper human for at least one day. Give it a try. Absolutely. And if, look, if carnival is too much or, or if it's a too much of a leap for you, even if you can do like low carb and then even doing keto and then taking out some stuff and doing carnival, not everybody has to go carnival. But the thing is when you take out all of the junk and you can feel it's almost, it is almost like feeling superhuman. It is almost like feeling for me, it is like feeling calm, energetic. It is feeling like you have your life back. For Kerry, he literally got his life back. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's li the literal fact that, yeah, I have to ahead. show you this real quick. This is my favorite shirt. I eat only meat. Ask me why. <laughs> and when people ask me why, that's why I say it's this saved my life. I really believe this saved my life. I wasn't living before this. So yeah, it's hard not to get excited about it. Yes. And now you're living. And what's, what is most impressive is that when I watch all of your, your videos and you show your whole family, so your daughters, Lily, Emma, what's your other two daughters' names? Uh, Alyssa, we have Lily, Alyssa, Katie, and Emma. The triplets are Alyssa, Katie, and Emma. But what was most interesting was the story with Lily. She went carnival for a good reason. What was her reason? Yes. So Lily has her whole health story similar to her dad, sadly. But uh, when she was 13, she had open heart surgery. And um, it wasn't a hereditary thing either. Her, her issue was completely different than mine. She had an uh, issue with her valve. She had open heart surgery and when she went in to get the open heart surgery, they gave me and Jen a phone and they're like, this is going to take eight, 10 hours. We'll call you when we need anything. Well, like an hour into the surgery, the phone rang and we're like, oh my God, what happened? We thought something horrible had happened. They're like, we can't do the surgery. And it turns out she has this skin condition. It's called HS. It's, it looks kind of like acne or inflammation and it was on her chest. And it was at that time, it was right where they had to open her chest up for this open heart surgery. So they sent her home and um, they said they sent her to a dermatologist to try to clear that up. She ended up having the open heart surgery uh, like two months later and thankfully it all went well. Um, but her story just got worse from there. The HS got worse and it spread over her chest and her back and we took her to another dermatologist. They tried creams, they tried pills, they tried all sorts of shots. Over the course of like five years, um, we tried everything. All these specialists, thousands of dollars to try to get rid of this HS for the poor kid. Um, so she had the open heart surgery, right? Well, then during um, the heart of the pandemic, uh, right when it had started, she um, passed out in the house. She, she screamed for her mom. She was in the bathroom and we went in there and she was laying on the bathroom floor. Her face was white. Her lips were purple. She was hardly breathing at all. And she was literally, I think, minutes away from dying. And we thought it was the pandemic. Like she's got this thing. Like, I don't know how it was possible too. because It was like the first week of it. Um, it turns out she had two blood clots in her lungs. And in retrospect, the reason she got her blood clots was due to more of this stuff that I hate. Uh, she was on medication when she was about, she, uh, she got her period at a really young age. Um, 
And that and all of the skin condition that she was having, the doctor suggested she go on birth control pills. It wasn't for birth control reasons, it was for hormonal reasons and try to get rid of her HS and help with her really horrible periods she was having. And I'm like, this is crazy, like 13 years old, we're not putting her on birth control pills, but after talking to more and more doctors, like this is actually really common. They were telling me this, they're like lots of girls are getting their periods younger and younger and they're getting it worse and worse and we don't know why. And so a lot of these girls are going on birth control pills for that reason. So Lily did that and they told us, they did say there's a really super small chance she could get a blood clot from it. Well, she did get a blood clot from it. It almost killed her. She had to take a helicopter to the hospital and um, <clears throat> she had to go on all sorts of medication. She was off of the birth control um, from that point forward. But uh, the HS continued and continued for years and years. And she came to me and her mom at one point and she's like, I just want to die. This hurts so bad. These doctors, nobody's helping. It's not getting any better. They keep trying all of these pills. The last dermatologist we took her to said, we can give her this injection, but it's going to completely shut down her immune system. And we don't know. It might work. It might not work. And I'm like, no, this is insane. Like nothing you've suggested has worked before. Why is this one going to work? And that was one of my other my wise for carnivore was me, but it was also, I watched a lot of Jordan uh, Peterson's daughter, Michaela Peterson. She totally reminded me of Lily. A lot of the issues Michaela had, Lily had. And Michaela has had an amazing turnaround doing lion diet and carnivore diet. And so uh, when I started carnivore, like I was, I was on day eight. I said to Lily, she had just turned 18, five years with this horrible, painful HS. I said, you're 18, you can do whatever you want. I'm not telling you, you gotta eat meat, but I'm like, Lily, I really think, now that I'm starting to think clear, that HS is just a reaction to the food you're eating or something, just try this. Try it for 30 days and see. She agreed, she tried it. On day eight, half of her back had cleared up. The HS was gone. By day 30, all of the HS was completely gone, 100% gone. And her periods like were, were gone, like were improved. She was since um, diagnosed with endometriosis, just really painful, horrible periods, completely improved doing carnivore. And then uh, she went on to do carnivore for longer than 30 days after that. She did lion diet with me for a while too. Uh, but her acne cleared up. There was one point, I think it was around day 25, she walked out of her bedroom. Jen and I looked at each other and we're like, who is she? She doesn't even look like the same person. Her acne cleared up. She had the carnivore glow. She'd lost some weight and her mood was just completely 180, completely changed. And that was been one of the most incredible things. So that that's Lily. That was kind of a long story, a quick story too. My other daughter, Emma, one of the triplets. Emma, vegan. of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vegan for mm -hmm. five years. She one day, I, I didn't tell her. People were like, you made her do this. I didn't tell her to do anything. She's like, I'm going to try this carnivore thing. She was tapping out as a vegan. She was so fatigued and so sickly, acne, pale, going to sleep at 530 at night, like just weak. She's like, I'm going to try this. And she decided to go full, uh, full reversal. And she started carnivore with me. When she ate bacon, it was like a light switch went off. Her face just started lighting up. I watched that video and then she's like, yeah. I feel bad. And there was a tear coming down her yeah, uh, like her face because she was, it's such an emotional event. And also the first time that she tried an egg and she's like, yes. oh my God, it tastes nice. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm Rita, like, I could well, not. Yeah, because it's real food. <laughs> Yes. That's what I said to her. She said the bacon tastes good. I'm like, yes, of course it does. You've been eating cauliflower for five years. You're giving your body what it's been begging for. Uh, the yeah. craziest thing, Rena, is seeing Emma eat a big fatty ribeye. Like she'll take a big chunk of fat, which is what you need on carnivore. People don't get enough fat on carnivore. Dr. Kiltz told me this. I love this. He said it should be called fativore. It's all about the fat. Emma will just eat big chunks of fat and whatever. She's just like a champ. She's she's killing it. Completely reversed. Like her mood, everything just completely changed on carnivore. That was remarkable, especially she did it for five years and just completely changed now. The ripple effect of carnivore is amazing. So I started doing it from Dante and Dr. Barry. Now my daughter Lily, my daughter Emma, my wife started it as well. Uh, my mom and my stepdad are doing it. Both of my sisters are doing it. And now each one of those people are a shining example. And now 10 more people and 10 more people. And do you see that with anything else? Do you see that with the vegan diet or Weight Watchers? No, you don't. You don't see or hear these stories with any other diet. People tell me, you would have done the same thing, Carrie, if you would have just ate vegetables. I'm like, show me the vegan videos where people are reversing uh, type 2 diabetes or clinical suicidal depression and they're reversing it. I don't see any of this out there, but I see it 
over and over and over again with carnivore. Absolutely. And if you know somebody out there that is suffering as much as Kerry has, depression, anxiety, diabetes, um, anything, any of these issues, maybe share this video, share one of Kerry's videos to them so they can learn more about carnivore. Even Dr. Ken Berry is a great reference. It's not really about pushing anything. It is about embracing this message because meat is power. Meat is, an, is the nutrients that we need to heal our brain and our body. And especially as we're seeing, we can transform our lives. You don't have to be stuck in the situation that you're in now. But I think another, another thing that people want to know about, as a last thing, they wanted to know what, what happens to your heart. What happened to your weight? Because you were 262 pounds. Is that right? Yes. Yep. Roughly? Yeah. So my 262 at my heaviest, I have lots of pictures. That was me at my heaviest. Um, I am down a hundred pounds since my heaviest. In fact, a little over a hundred. I didn't lose all of that on carnivore. People always give me a hard time. I lost most of that on carnivore. I did a little bit on keto yo-yoing throughout the years, but yeah, at, I even have the, I have it somewhere. I was at a doctor's appointment. They weighed me and I couldn't believe it because I hadn't weighed myself for a long time. 262. And as of right now, today, I'm, I'm right around 160. So a little over a hundred. Uh, pounds down so but the main thing Kerry it's the weight loss is very important but the hardest thing that you that anyone is going to find especially if they want to lose weight is maintaining that weight so for you yes you lost a lot of the weight on carnival and on keto and yo-yo dieting but you have got to this weight but you're maintaining it and that's the key thing if somebody wants to change it's very easy to lose weight it's very hard to maintain your weight loss yes don't ever do moderation is my advice for people don't do the moderation. <laughs> just eat the eat the proper human. Yeah, it, just eat the proper human diet for the rest of your life and you'll be fine. That's all you have to do. Yes, and you don't have to do lion diet. So I know that I'm interviewing Kerry and he's talking about lion diet. Dante was doing the lion diet and he got amazing results. Even just doing carnival, even including dairy in your carnival is so much better than sugar, seed oils, all the crap, all the toxins, having loads of vegetables and salads, it's ruining your gut, it's ruining your brain, it's, your, it's giving you so much inflammation. So please, people, if you want to do carnival, do carnival. Or if you have questions, go to Kerry. Now, the last thing that I wanted to ask you about was this amazing project that you're doing, which is called the Carnival Documentary. Can you tell us more about that? Yes. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier, I learned about keto many years ago. I actually learned about it from watching a documentary on Netflix. It's kind of a little unknown one called Fathead, but it was really good. And I didn't know anything about keto before. And my biggest thing with all this is, yeah, it's great. I lost a hundred pounds, but the biggest thing is overcoming the depression, anxiety, and being hopeless. And I know there's so many other people out there. I'm reaching a lot of people and there's so many great people like Rena, Dr. Barry, all these people reaching people on YouTube. But I believe that's just a small subset of the population out there. There's so many people on these big streaming services like Netflix or HBO, and they're not going to, they're not going to see this message. So I decided kind of early on, I want to do, there's nothing, there's, there's some documentaries on keto. There's nothing on carnivore. Like I said, uh, over six months ago, I didn't even know what carnivore was. So I wanted to uh, do a documentary on carnivore and it's crazy what's happened in the last six months. We have a whole team of people that are working on this with me. Um, the purpose of this isn't to tell people you need to do carnivore. The purpose is simply to share the documented examples like my own. I think those are so powerful. Here's what Dante went through. Here's what I went through. Here's what uh, Sean from Intentional Carnivore went through, lost 243 pounds in one year and share those examples, but not just from weight loss. So we're going to follow people for one year. Uh, people that are trying to overcome depression, anxiety is going to be a big one, uh, but also women's health, IBS, type two diabetes, obesity, of, of course, is a big one. And then the other really big one that I just love is aging. I'm talking to so many people in their 60s, 70s and 80s thriving on carnivore. Now, who can't relate to that or who doesn't get scared of getting old and have mobility issues? Rena, I'm hearing this time and time again from people. It doesn't have to be that way. I'm talking to 80 year olds that are just, they're, they're running, they're jogging. They don't have these mobility issues and these problems other people do. Most of that is just inflammation from the foods people are eating. So yeah, we started doing this documentary. Um, it's completely crowdfunded. We've done some fundraisers. We did a 24 hour live stream at Rena joined. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah. And we started filming a couple months ago. I started filming with uh, 
a gentleman named Bill Knott from Alaska. He's 700 pounds. He saw one of my YouTube videos. He sent me this essay and it just broke my heart and it resonated with me. Hopeless, hopeless depression. Uh, 700 pounds, hasn't left his house in four years. Trapped, a prisoner to his food, a prisoner in his house. And he's like, I want help, but I don't know what to do. I don't have the money to buy meat in Alaska. I'd like to share my story on YouTube. Maybe that could earn me some money. I was like, yes, yes, yes. We could do all those things. Let me help you. And so I, I replied to his comment and I never heard back from him. Sometimes that happens on YouTube. Those comments go off into the ether and I couldn't stop thinking about Bill. So I did a video. This is Bill, by the way. I did a video. Um, I said, Bill from Alaska, I want to help you. Uh, what do we got to do? I told him we can get a YouTube video. I said, the carnivore community is amazing. They will get behind you. I said, I will give you money to buy steaks. I will help you build your YouTube channel up. I will help you promote it. He's I, a couple like, I think it was a couple hours later, I got an email with this picture. Hi, Carrie. So he saw my video, which I just put out there. And then we got on, we got a phone call. This is so crazy how all this happened, by the way. I'm, I'm like, I love this guy. Like, he's my brother. Like, we, I, I don't know what, we just have this deep connection, the depression and, and those things. And I don't know what it is, but within three weeks, my daughter, Emma, the former vegan turned carnivore and myself flew out to Alaska because his story was so incredible and so important. And we were starting to film the documentary. He's going to be one of the main stories in the documentary. So we flew out there. Emma and I were driving to Bill's house. And we're like, this is insane. Like, I didn't even know this guy three weeks ago. We're going to go knock on his door. And so, yeah, we went out there for a week and we filmed the, the start of his carnivore journey. He is, this is the incredible thing. He just hit um, 60 days. He's at two. It just went by so quick too. The first week. He, he called me up and he's like, Carrie, this is insane. Like, what is going on? All this pain I had in my knees and my lower back is gone. How can this happen so quickly? Inflammation. I'm like, Bill, it goes away so quickly. Inflammation. All of that aside, just one last real quick thing on Bill. He's the sweetest, loveliest, nicest guy out there. But his mood went from hopelessness and I have no purpose in life to he is legitimately inspiring people. Every video he does on YouTube, it's getting like 20, 30,000 views. Bill, you convinced me I'm starting carnivore. Now he went from having no purpose to having the ultimate purpose. And he went from being hopeless to his mood is amazing. Now he's just so happy. He's a proper natural human. We were going to just film him. We're going to film him at the end of the documentary. When he, when he's ready and he calls me and he's ready to walk out the doors for the first time. Like, can you imagine seeing that? But I'm going to go up there in the meantime too in winter to catch his journey mid journey. Uh, but it's going to be such a beautiful moment when he walks out those doors. And the thing is, this is great for Bill, but there's millions of bills all over the world that are hopeless and they have no idea this is an option. So that's why we're doing the, the documentary. I'm, I'm really excited about it. And we're, we're going to film another person in two weeks, um, Maggie, Maggie, who's an 82 year old carnivore living in Canada, Dr. Chafee's friend, Maggie, she's been thriving on carnivore for 60 years as a cattle rancher at 82 years old. We're going to go film her. So that's the next big step for the documentary. But yeah, if anyone's interested in a documentary, we're trying to follow real people. It's, um, carnivore It's completely free. It's all crowdfunded. You can go on there and register. If you want to share your carnivore story with us, either for the documentary or for us to shout you out on YouTube or talk about your story on YouTube. If you will, if, if it'll inspire other people, I'm interested in elevating any of those voices. And and I'm going to leave all the links in the show notes of this video so that you can just click on there, find out more information about Kerry's wonderful work. And I think what you're doing, Kerry, is absolutely incredible. Not only have you changed your life, your daughter's lives, your wife, your mom, your whole family, you're trying to change the world. And so for every person out there, if you hear Kerry's story, if you resonate with what Kerry is saying, please share his work. Go onto his channel, Homestead How share his channel to other people because Kerry is doing great work. He's so passionate. You can tell from his eyes, from his heart, his soul, he is so genuine, wanting to change the world, wanting to help people with carnival. So if you have somebody out there that needs help, please share Kerry's channel as well as all of the carnival content out there because it can truly transform your life. So Kerry, I just want to say a big thank you for being here. I think I've just told people how to find you, but is there any other way that they can find you? 
No, you nailed it. And I just want to say the same thing to you. It's amazing what you're doing. I love watching your videos and uh, the passions there too. It started out as a passion for me and now it's like my purpose in life. It's a responsibility to share this with other people and you, you're doing it awesome. I love your channel and I really appreciate this opportunity. So thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. And maybe we might get you back to talk about your blood work results and your results from your heart test as well, because I'm very, very curious to see that. But I just want to say a big thank you, Kerry, and I'm sure that we're going to see you very soon. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Kerry. Now you might like to watch this interview with Dante. He's been eating meat for 1000 days and this is going to talk about what happened to his blood. You might want to give it a watch if you're new to carnivore. I'll see you guys next week.